CD Tavenor. Thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. I'm your host, Matthew Whiteside, as always. Do that a little bit. And as you can't see CD, uh, he is, I'm not talking to myself. Um, <laughs> I am here. <laughs> You're there. Man, what's going on, CD, or uh, Tavenor, what's going on, bro? Uh, not much. A uh, pleasure uh, joining you on this call. I'm excited to talk about my uh, first, my debut novel, First of Their Kind, uh, which uh, hopefully we'll get into the, the nitty gritty details about what I what I think makes this story great. Well, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that because right off the bat, man, great name for a first novel, <laughs> First yeah, of I, Their I, Kind. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> the cover art looks it looks fantastic too. It's got this. Uh, like holographic looking red and blue eye that looks like a digital digital eye what's so wh what is this what's the story about first of their kind yeah I, absolutely so uh first shout out to violetta nedkova who's the book cover artist you uh, definitely all should check her out uh she's pretty awesome on twitter too so okay. the story is Okay, so First of Their Kind is about the first synthetic intelligence. I use that term purposefully in my story to differentiate from what people, you know, ordinarily think is artificial intelligence. Everyone talks about artificial intelligence. People talk about Watson. They talk about, you know, what AI is going to do to revolutionize uh, our economies. And, mm -hmm. like, that's one version of AI. That's honestly, like, one of the more plausible versions of AI where it's, you know, you create a computer program that... Mm -hmm is really, really freaking smart and do lots of things all at once. <laughs> and right. so in this story, I have developed the idea of synthetic intelligence, which in this right. world, artificial intelligence is a thing. It does its thing. It's these powerful computer programs that are figuring out really complex problems. But then alongside that, there's a scientist actually trying to develop artificial minds that actually have consciousness like humans. So in this this world starts and the story starts in 2048, so not too far in the future. And you've got a, a scientist at a university in Switzerland doing computational science research, and he develops a, a synthetic intelligence not by creating a program, but by creating uh -huh. an actual like the way I describe it in the book is computational metamaterials. You know, to get some like fun hard science uh nice. ideas going but that it's actually it's essentially more like he creates a brain it's not something that is uh like it's not programmed it's the way that it's put together creates a conscious mind like a brain has a mind that's the very initial premise of the story and then the story goes from there wow so where do you where did this uh, this idea come from is this something you're extremely interested in yourself like the idea of synthetic intelligence of building a consciousness into something that's not human is that so, something that's like i got you want to find out about uh i mean i i don't pretend to have i'm not a, i'm not a computer scientist i'm i'm actually my expertise is environmental law but when i was an undergraduate this is under undergraduate studies i studied philosophy and so right. this is where uh this concept comes from i was taking a cognitive science class and okay. we were studying various theories of mind in this philosophy class and really thinking about what it means for a mind to be a mind. And there's this there's this famous um, philosophical problem known as the Chinese room. And it's okay. this question where you've got a you've got a box, just a black box inside the box is a person who is got an instruction manual. And from one side of the box, he receives inputs. Uh, instructions about like he receives inputs and then inside the box he's got an instruction manual of how to interpret those inputs and then send out outputs from the outside it looks like this box is just like having novel thought but really it's just receiving instructions and the person inside is and is interpreting it and it, it's a thought experiment to exp to like kind of say hey actual conscious artificial intelligence isn't possible because in the end it's just going to be following rules as opposed to what uh, a human mind is doing with the brain that's that's a thought experiment in traditional philosophy whether you agree or disagree with it is another question but that's right. where that's where the idea comes from and so i i took the idea okay let's just assume for the sake of argument that uh that's true and you couldn't ever program a like an artificial conscious mind 
what yeah. then would be the alternative in order to create a conscious mind? And that was me studying philosophy at the time. I don't, <laughs> I don't dive into that world Dude. anymore, but now I have fun exploring it through fiction. <laughs> Dude, I love philosophy. It's like, it's like thought porn. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely. what it is, man. Yeah. And that is such a cool, because you have to wonder too. I mean, how is that any different from the way we, we work? Like, that's like, the types of questions that cognitive scientists think about. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like I, getting, getting all this input from the yeah. outside world and we're literally just having to somehow interpret it. Right. And do with it. But it's all based on physical laws and physical rules yeah. of the universe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I guess my the, the, the way that I approach it and it, it and it's the, the underpinnings of this story and the main character is that – so our brains are super complex. They don't have an underlying like code program that they're running on. You can't like, you know, access your brain and be like, okay, let's edit the code. It's all, right. it's biological neural synapses interacting in super complex ways. And like, you know, you get your input, your visual stimuli or what other other stimuli, you know, touch, hearing, whatever. And that right. sends triggers through the system that then our system reacts. And so like, I'm I'm totally an advocate for determinism. I'm not like a free will person. Like I, at the very base level, everything is physically determined, as you said. Um, but the idea is is that those physically determined processes aren't like digestible down to a like programming code that you could edit. And that's where I take the like the synthetic okay. intelligence idea I play with is that this scientist creates a new mind that works on the same concept that you're putting fundamental building blocks together to create a mind but instead of being biological this one's synthetic yeah wow are you, are you hoping to answer a question like did i know when i write something i i hope to answer some some form of question and i know some people who write fiction look to do this but is this something you were like looking for some deeper meaning in this in the writing of you know figuring out synthetic intelligence and this doctor who's trying to discover and, and create this alternate life form almost. Yeah. So my, so what ends up happening in the story and I'm not going to try and spoil don't give too it all. much. Yeah. I don't want to spoil too much, <laughs> but the main character is not the scientist. The main character is the synthetic intelligence. So uh, the, the point of view of the story is entirely from the synthetic intelligence's perspective. Um, okay. And so while the, the, the professor, Dr. Wallace Theron, is an important character and is always present in some form throughout the story, like the story is through the eyes of the synthetic intelligence, which is the uh, like what I have a lot of fun with. And so what yeah. I am trying to answer that question you, you, you raise is like yeah. really if we are to create new life forms – how are we as humans going to end up viewing them? And so, like, I mean, people are really yeah. scared about, like, what's going to happen if we develop sufficiently advanced AI. Um, and so I'm positing a synthetic intelligence that's more like a person than what any of the artificial intelligences are like in this world. And then yeah. that really freaks people out. Like, that freaks out um, – people that have just basic economic interests because they're like, oh, now you've created a mind that doesn't need sleep, but they also have personhood. So are they just going to take everybody's jobs? Like you've got people that are like yeah. thinking like that. You've also got religious people that are freaking out because they're like, uh, does this thing have a soul or is this thing a demon? Like, what is this? This isn't human. <laughs> like, you know, like, so you've got all of these different perspectives about like what they are. Yeah. And so by the end of the story, I'm, and this is the first of at least two books I've written. The second book will be releasing in June, actually. And so these two books together form a coherent story, though my hope is to tell more after the second one. Um, hopefully by the end of those two stories, people are really able to think about, you know, okay, how are we going to think about different people when – if we actually were to create minds like this, or if we encountered, say, aliens that think differently than us. But then at the same time, think about how when you just meet people in everyday life that are thinking differently than you and have different approaches, how quickly we judge those people just for, like, thinking differently. I was going to say, man, like, I can already tell you. <laughs> like, <laughs> the way we treat each other 
as other uh, as fellow human beings already it's like we're just now getting to a point where we're starting to accept one another for all of our and even then it's like barely yeah but, <laughs> like it, now now let's throw in this synthetic uh humanoid creature thing that we're not sure if it has a soul or whatever it's like i can just imagine it's going to be <laughs> utter chaos yeah absolutely um and i i think that's a, that's a that's a definitely a good way to sum it up because you've also got you know lots of different competing interests going on in the world so one of the things that i explore in this story is that like their creation and i use the pronoun there very intentionally um yeah. The synthetic intelligence end up using they pronouns, singular they, um, because I mean they're not biological. It doesn't make sense for them. Like already, it doesn't make sense for them to adopt any of the traditional gender identities. Right. But also, it is so depersonalizing. So they decide to adopt they. And this has been one of the really hard things in writing this book. Is as a guy, I like so often would default into he and it was really bad like that was the hardest thing to edit out of the book was like i would just accidentally <laughs> like so write he things. and uh, i would be like no they <laughs> um and uh now i forget where i was going with that <laughs> um talking about intentionally using the pronoun they yeah for, um, yeah so they're not biologically yeah exactly um yeah, now I've, I'm really lost. What was your original... Okay. Yeah, what was so, your last comment? <laughs> um, I was just talking about them being human. Like, the, the hate that we already have for humans on on the basic level. Like Oh, the, I remember now. Yes. Okay. I remember. Hatred. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> back. so I, this story doesn't occur in a vacuum. Their okay. story... You know, they are a new technological advance. But then at the same time... The, technology is rapidly advancing around them so you've got cultures and individuals that are reacting not only to their development but other major technological advancements that are occurring too and then they as a person now in this world are also have forcing themselves to react to those technological advancements and like it's like so one of the themes of the story is definitely grappling with like rapid technological change because you know the past hundred years we've seen crazy technological technological change and we're yeah. only starting to see the rate of technological change we might experience over the next hundred well, yeah with supercomputers i mean it's like we did they hit the point where the whatever the sequence is where the the computing power doubles every so yeah. amount of years it's like they've they've passed that to where it's like infinite now and it's yeah. like yeah. absolutely gonna be mind-boggling in the next 10 to 20 years what it looks like yeah absolutely and so i have a lot of fun playing with a lot of different technologies i play with virtual reality i play with uh obviously artificial intelligence synthetic intelligence robotics uh different forms of uh i play with different different levels of communication more in the second book but uh in the in the in the first book i'm not going to spoil it but i have a, a fun technology that i introduce about halfway through the story that really like shakes everything up and is hopefully unexpected for the type of story I'm writing. People aren't going to expect it in the book they're reading. So I think that's the most fun part. Like, so you've created a, a technology that you've come up with on your own. Um, and it's well, we're, we're talking 28 years here in the future. Yeah. Uh, that's, I think that's like the most fun future to write is the, the foresee, like the very near future, because there's going to be these subtle changes that, you know, we can talk about flying cars and all that stuff in the very far future or something. But like in 20 years from now, coming up with something that very slight that, you know, nobody thinks about, but could in essence completely change the way we do everything. Like I think buildings are going to be completely obsolete, like where people actually go into a place of work. And I think they're going to be all filled with uh, supercomputers and the, <laughs> and the buildings are just going to be holding places for these super they gonna be super cooled and cold areas but they're not going to be useful anymore because everybody's gonna be working in a virtual space yeah no i think that's a great concept and i actually i played with that a lot in this story the idea of um of virtual workspaces so like cool. one of my favorite scenes in the book uh okay. is the the main character the synthetic intelligences go to essentially a garden party in okay. virtual reality nice. uh, it's a ma it's a masquerade party 
And so okay. it's I play with this idea that like they're going to this party and they everyone lives in a world now where identities are just like I mean every, I mean we're seeing this now people's public identities are just thrown everywhere like you just absolutely know who everyone is through the internet yeah and so people intentionally go to these digital masquerade parties where they're literally masking their identity in the party and people are trying to like figure out who each other are in this virtual world uh <laughs> Uh, because everybody knows, yes, like too. usually, usually through the virtual world, you can just walk by someone and just like see their identity, just like pop above their head or whatever. Yeah. And uh, in in that scene, that I play with uh, really fun physics because if you have a virtual reality, you don't have to follow the laws of physics. So like they're just like walking along a hallway, and just the hallway's just like twisting and gravity's shifting, and <laughs> oh, um, or like the Dang. building they walk into looks small, but you open the door and then it's really big inside, and. Oh wow! Stuff like that, like Alice in Wonderland and uh, an Inception. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, there's just so many fun things you can play with, and because virtual reality is really just like a dreamscape almost. I mean, we can. Yeah. That's that's amazing, man. And so I also, know, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you. I want to know your personal take on the because um, talk about the singularity. You yeah. know, where human and machine kind of become one, and it's all all this whole process that we're moving towards we're, with computing power and all that kind of stuff and artificial intelligence. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, do you have a? I guess I'm not saying investment in it, but like, do you have any kind of like mental claim in in terms of which way the the pendulum is swinging? So I think this, and so this is definitely a personal opinion that I inject a little bit into the book. Uh, okay. I personally think that the, the there's so, so there's some people who approach the singularity as this idea that like technology and people are going to like merge in some strange way right uh there's other people who view the singularity just more as like it, we hit a point of like infinite technological advancement uh and i'm definitely in that latter camp i fundamentally reject the idea that we can like shift our minds into robots uh because i am a I'm a hard determinist and my thought would be is if even if it's, it's possible to comp copy a mind or like copy a consciousness and upload it, you'd mm -hmm. only be uploading a copy. You wouldn't actually be uploading yourself. So there wouldn't be continuation of consciousness. So if even if you could upload a mind to a brain, you would be killing yourself eventually. You, your biological mind would still be separate. That's my yeah, opinion. That's that's interesting because you have to also think like there's something about our our bodies and our minds that contain this spirit or whatever you want to call it right how and we don't even know that we don't know what that is we think we have an idea that our mind contains our consciousness and our spirit but how the heck do we know right and so if like we were able to somehow transmit it into a machine how do we know that we've made this machine capable of holding <laughs> yeah spirit. it's like the yeah. ghostbusters thing you know when you push yeah it. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah how do we know and, it's gonna hold man yeah and i i so my, my thought is is that like well and so this is one of the fun things about consciousness too is that most people think of consciousness as like purely the brain but like our nervous system is entirely throughout our body like our consciousness is like if you like if you chop off an arm you lose part of your nervous system and like the nerves that are throughout your arm are sending inputs and in, to your brain and like that's part of your mind even though you don't think about it because it's such an unconscious process but like yeah. when you poke your mind your hand that sends like a poke to your mind and then your mind is reacting to that feeling and yeah um and so like the so yeah i i think singularity is really more about we're going to hit a point where we just can't and i think we're already partially there in the sense that we can't keep up with the rate of technological advancement our laws can't keep up with the rate of technological advancement um there it's really just going to be advancements will continue to come so quickly that you won't even it'll just be seamless constant advancement that we can't really predict what's going to happen um but and i'm going to inject a little bit of my other side of my work into this that's not going to happen if we don't solve climate change <laughs> yeah agreed <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like true. just gonna say matter. just to say that if like technological singularity is meaningless if we don't fix climate change 
Well, hopefully they can go hand in hand. Like hopefully the oh, technology yeah. that's that's going to be coming along is going to be able to advance us to a place where we're able to reverse the damage that we've done. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, there's to bring this back into the realm of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, one of the important aspects of you know, combating climate change is really revolutionizing our energy grid systems. And AI is going to be fundamentally important to ensuring we have a smart grid that can redirect electricity at where to the places that need it most and can utilize battery storage correctly at the right times of day and like can turn solar panels and uh, turn solar panels to actually. So I, I visited a solar farm where they've got solar panels that will rotate with uh, the sun so that they yeah. have ideal sun all day and so like when do you turn the wind turbines on or off when do you fire up whatever your baseload generation is going to be whether it's nuclear natural gas hydro whatever like wh like that's going to take ai to do correctly um but we got to be setting the groundwork for that now <laughs> except we have to accept that we have a problem we just yes <laughs> yes it's absolutely like, i think i think the majority of people accept it it's just the yeah the most important people, though. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, in first of their kind, because it does take place 30 years in the future. Cli this isn't a story about climate change, but I definitely make a point of like emphasizing that it's there in the background. It's kind of like I pretty much take kind of a, a middle ground approach. There's like it's not that we just like magically fix it all. There's still like impacts going on in the background. They just don't affect the character's story, um, though. There's a few like tangential references to it. Like there, there's. There's a moment where they're stand they're they're on a beach and they just have a thought about how like is this gonna beach this beach gonna be here in the next fifty years yeah but I try to keep it a little bit out of that because my, no, my the thing is the beach the beach is gonna be everywhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's yeah, the problem I, I live in Ohio <laughs> it's gonna be prime real estate <laughs> yeah dude, you want to buy some beachside property now that's you gotta get in you gotta yeah. buy Ohio yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's for it's sure. uh it's sad, but we have to laugh about it because it's like God. Yeah, that's how you handle it. Just be like, oh yeah, you know, when we die, the world's probably gonna be crumbling. <laughs> my, poor, my poor children. Hopefully they hopefully they can figure it out. Um, well, yeah, hopefully we can make it so they don't. But <laughs> yeah, hopefully they don't have to. Hopefully. Yeah. And the the whole synthetic and artificial intelligence is is a fantastic thing. So we're not constantly just wasting these fossil fuels and like burning off in crazy crazy rate all the time because it's just going to places it doesn't need to be like i mean i don't know so i want to uh the book is coming out april 30th correct yes april 30th is when the e is the ebook will officially launch on april 30th uh, I've got to square up exactly when I'm going to be officially launching the paperback. The paperback may actually be for sale before that um, because for those of you who don't uh, engage with the self-publishing process, uh, self-publishing is annoying and you can't do pre-orders for paperbacks. So you can't like yeah. set the date in the, in the future. So I may very well have the paperback for sale like April 22nd. Um, but then the the ebook will be releasing April 30th. But the plus side of that is if the paperbacks for sale early, then people can drop their reviews if uh, sooner than the ebook releases. So yeah, well, um, you're self publishing, but you have your own company. You're or the own your own publisher, uh, Two Doctors Media Collaborative. But it's more than just a publishing company, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the I, I'll be publishing my books under it. I've got long term plans to publish hopefully other people too, if I can prove that I'm successful. Uh, and I mean, stay tuned for titles for myself and hopefully other people in the near future. Awesome. But uh, the long, long-term plans for this name is I, I'm working on this uh, this business with both my, uh, my co-founder, Brian Tim. And so to give context for the name Two Doctors, I have a Juris Doctorate as an attorney okay. and he's getting his phd in uh sociology so two doctors okay. not the hey. type of doctors you usually think about but uh we kind of like that uh yeah. so uh yeah so the long-term plan is books and board games uh we both are avid lovers of board games like he, he he's going to bowling green state university right now which is about two hours north of where i live 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, whenever he comes down to Columbus, Ohio, uh, we are always playing board games. And uh, awesome. we have we both have board game concepts. I have a prototype of a board game. He's got a prototype of a board game. We have friends who have prototypes of board games. And so the long-term plan is to have this dual collaborative experience where we've got people publishing books and we've got people creating board games and hopefully together those uh two media forms will help support each other uh and maybe we'll have people writing books about our board games uh yeah (laughs) (laughs) tie-ins that's the franchise now (laughs) (laughs) so it's great to have those ambitious projects that you're that you're working on um it, it takes it takes a lot of effort, right? It, I mean, it takes a lot of uh, collaboration, especially when you're working with somebody, uh, with two other people. Um, yeah. it, it takes that collective mindset of this is the pace we're going to go at. These are the objective goals that we have in mind. Yeah. Here are the here are the ways we're going to go about it without like going off crazy yeah. routes on your own right yeah and we're, we're definitely we're starting we're starting small so we've got so and so the other partner in the in the team is my my wife uh, who's our creative director uh and uh she i just to make sure people understand i totally wanted to include her somehow in the name of the brand but she actually really pushed us to stick with two doctors media collaborative as the name because she thinks it sounds great and i agree uh but i didn't want to just like be like oh and also this third person um (laughs) but she's definitely she's definitely part of the team (laughs) yeah two doctors one wife (laughs) um (laughs) that that sends the wrong connotations um <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, we're starting small. We've got our books that we're publishing this year. Um, and my my wife is in school right now for graphic design. And so she's honing her book cover design s- skills. Um, and like one of the reasons why she didn't do the book cover for this book is because she's like heavily engrossed in uh, classes right now and her own work. And so like she wouldn't have had time. Um, but I'm looking forward to the times when I'm able to work uh, really closely with her on other book covers. And I actually have a – our first uh, soft release was actually a short story I wrote um, back in January called Legion of Mono. And she made the book cover for that. And that's available on Kindle Unlimited. Okay. I'll put a, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video as well. Awesome. Yeah. It's actually available. For, this isn't relevant now. But it was – actually, no, this will be relevant. You can edit this however you want. Uh, it is not going to be available on Kindle Unlimited when this airs. It'll actually be permanently free at that point. So Legion of Mono is permanently free and available to download from Amazon and any other ebook store. So sweet. Yeah. So so people can get a taste of your writing. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, if we want to add this in, so um, in the publishing process, there's you know you. As self-publishers, we got to think about all of the different ways that you got to get your name in front of people. Like that is the important thing to do. Get people yeah. to trust you as a writer so they want to yeah. buy all your books because they yeah. enjoy your stories. And that's the hardest thing to do because we don't have, you know, some insert big traditional publisher name here backing up our work. And yeah. there is this concept known as a book magnet, which is a book that you have uh, permanently free. And that any you just anyone can download it for free. Always they read it. It's short. They get a taste of your writing, and they're like, "Okay, I trust this author. I'm gonna go check out their other stuff and actually pay them for their work." And so, Legion of Mono, uh, I, I I ran it through the three month Kindle Unlimited uh, trial period to see how yeah. Kindle Unlimited worked. Got a uh, got a few purchases that way. It's done pretty well. It's got a. Uh, it's sitting at like a four star review with seven reviews right now. It's only 25 pages, but it is a fantastic little fantasy story, short story I wrote that deals with uh, a man who is a the final commander of a tiny little soldier unit defending his, their people from a genocidal empire that's just trying to completely wipe them out. It's very, very 300 esque. I've had a lot of people compare it to 300 and it's like story oh, yeah. style. Um, and. Uh, it's fun, and uh, th- this is uh, talking about uh, you know really being accepting of people. This story yeah. has been really fun to see people's reactions to because the main character is a guy, and he has a husband. And in fantasy writing, 
there's not a lot of LGBT representation. It's getting better. It's getting a lot better. And I feel like the indie author community is actually being like super aware of this issue and is doing a lot to try and combat it. Yeah. Um, but I've had a few people who have had jarring moments when reading the story because I actually don't explicitly state the gender of the main character until like yeah. five pages in. It's all yeah. context clues. Uh, he's talking about it's from the first person perspective, which uh-huh. can affect that. Um, and so when people get to that moment, when it actually it matters, is, yeah, <laughs> there's a line, there's a line where he says, you know, I need to do my duty as a husband and a father. Right. And like, he says that internally. And that's the first moment when his gender is actually stated in the story. It's actually fully stated in the Amazon description. So that also just reveals to me who doesn't read the Amazon description. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But um, uh, there are some people who have told me when they got to that moment and they had their assumptions checked because they actually were reading the story as if it was a woman because he had, she, there's a husband in the play and they're like, Oh, wait, that's actually really cool. I was in this weird assumption space where I just assumed, but you did a good job of like checking my assumptions and realizing that like, you know, I shouldn't necessarily assume that it's a woman because there's a husband in play. But then there are other people who get super pissed. (laughs) And I, it's, it's interesting (laughs) because that, (laughs) it's like, yeah, yeah. And um, like, it it is like, yeah, it's an intentionally jarring moment, but like I, I, I understand people's needs to like escape in fantasy and be fully entertained, but I also like don't want any of my writing to just be pure escapism. I want people to think. Yeah. So in a short story, I feel like a short story is the perfect medium to jar people. Maybe not in a novel, but uh, in a short story, yeah, you, want you have to that finish it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, if you hit them, if you hit them too hard in the novel, they're like, I'm, I'm done. Screwed, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so talking about, you know, earlier we were talking about stories having meaning and like, yeah. that's just one of the jarring moments in that story. There's another one later on that I won't reveal. Cause that's the more, honestly, that's the more important moment at the end of the story. But, uh, uh, that sounds cool. I'm it's a, it it's a what's fun the, story. What's the name of it again? Legion of Mono. And so that's my first official publishing release, but I don't, okay. consider, that's not a novel. It's 7,000 words. Yeah. yeah. Short story. That's very cool, man. Um, so, as a as a practicing environmental uh, lawyer, when do you find time to write these these books? I mean, you've That's already written just... two. <laughs> like you, I know you're I know you're busy. I can't imagine you're not. So, I so first of their kind. I've been working on for a long time. And I actually, this is a good opportunity to talk about that public, that editing process. I think it's a really important, I learned a really important lesson as a writer when I first started writing this book. So Mm -hmm. I started, I, the very, very first draft of this book was actually finished when I was an undergraduate. So at the very end of my senior year. Uh, And so I finished it up. I did a, I did an edit and I was a stupid, arrogant 20 year old who was like, Oh, I'm totally ready to send this to an editor. And so I said, I said, (laughs) huh? What'd you say? This book is done. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, And I sent the, the first, this, it was essentially, I would say it was probably a third draft. It was like a second or third draft. So I sent this to a con, a content editor, uh, and she tore it to shreds. Like literally that book is not this book like this is not like that first draft i literally hit the reset button and so go the whole thing rewrote the entire there's okay so the very last chapter of the second book is actually the only part of the story that still exists that like i it's sufficient it's significantly edited but like there are significant chunks of that writing that were in that first draft, but that's the only part. That was the only part. <laughs> yeah. That's um, crazy, so, man. So I walked into law school with the task of writing an entirely new book. <laughs> um, I bet that felt great. Yeah. So, <laughs> so oftentimes, you know, people talk about like 
oh, my first book took six years to write. I would say that this book really took me law school to write. I wrote it while I was in law school. And so I would say that three year timeline was actually pretty decent for being in law school. Um, obviously, my goals going on from here on out are to write faster uh, now that I'm not in law school. Um, but yeah, so I finished law school uh, and I did throughout like every year was like a different stage of the process, you know, doing uh, new drafts. Uh, I, there was one point where I printed out the book and did line edits in a binder and mm-hmm. then rewrote the entire book into a computer and a new word document, implementing those edits and new edits. Yeah. Um, and, and then I got to the, the final stage. I, 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 I went through the querying process at first, but the original, this this book was originally going to be one, these two books were going to be one book and that yeah. book together was 155,000 words which is yeah. not conducive for the querying process for traditional publishing that is yeah. not going to sell for a debut novel um and so after i went through the querying process i you know sat down i was like okay i actually think i want to dive into self publishing because i like the agency that i have to really tell the story the way i want to tell it um, and I also want, also, I've been doing, a, I've been doing a lot of research on that, you know, like if you can do self-publishing right and you invest the time and money into it, mm-hmm. uh, it can potentially be more lucrative than traditional publishing because the royalties are so much higher. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously there's risk involved, but, uh, I mean, 70% though is yeah, 70% is huge. Um, yeah. exactly. Uh, you and so I, deci- I decided, I was like, okay, I'm going to self-publish. And so then I looked at my 155,000 word book and I was like, okay, now I got to figure out how I'm going to sell a 155,000 word book. And I looked at it and I realized that really it was two books. The, the first part of the story, the, this, the first of their kind is one book. And then there are the, the, the second two parts of the book. So I had a part one, two, and three those together are one book. And I realized that really I need to separate these and Mm -hmm. sell them as two separate books, uh, which, and they're both, they have. And so then I, you know, I, the next editing process was making sure that both sections had a consistent narrative um, and were self-contained because obviously there's still some work to do after that. And so I did some final there and then I worked with an editor uh, to do the final copy edits, and now we're sh- where we are now. And now wow. I just realized I never actually answered your question. So I'm going to answer your question about <laughs> how I have time to do all of this. Just, ig- just <laughs> ignore me. <I'm> not- <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I, so I wake up at like 6.30, and I do about two hours of editing or writing every day at that time. And then I go to work at nine and I, I work in the nonprofit sector for law. So fortunately I have a nine to five job. I'm not, I, I don't make as much, but I'm not in the position as some of my uh, fellow law graduates that have those 80 to 90 hour work weeks. Yeah, uh, nonstop. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I'm really thankful to work where I do because that gives me the work life balance to do this. Right. Um, and I still feel fully invested in what in, in my legal work as well. I like having this dual career. So I, I, I spend time in the morning when I wake up, I get home, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it all. It, and so like I always have that morning slot and yep. then evenings are all dependent on what I'm doing with my wife. Maybe we'll go to a coffee shop together and work together because she's got her projects that she's working on. Um, or maybe if, if she's working, if she's got a shift where she's working, I'll go to a coffee shop and work. But, uh, it's funny because when I was in law school, I never wanted to do the 80 to 90 hour work weeks, but now I'm pretty much doing 80 to 90 hour work weeks <laughs> just yeah. with two jobs, <laughs> two jobs, man. And that's yeah. it. Cause is this something you, you see yourself? Like, do you want to, do you always want to practice, be able to practice environmental law and write, or do you want writing to be something to where it's like, it takes off? And that's what you end up doing. So I, I definitely think that I've, I've oscillated back and forth on this question, but I absolutely think that I will always want to have a foot in that public interest environmental world because 
Uh, even even if I hit a point where like I was like magically a bestseller making a hundred thousand dollars a year off my books or something like you know pray that happens but like if that were to happen I think I would still stick with working in the environmental law field because it is so fundamentally important to uh, you know the future of this planet <laughs> that we're yeah. working to protect our environment. <laughs> and have you thought of, like have you seen have you read the book Gray Mountain by uh, John Grisham? No, I've not. What's so it? it's a uh, it's about like environmental law and stuff like that, what's going on. But um, have you ever thought about doing that kind of writing? I mean, because you have a distinct view of the world from yeah. your, your position of your study. Um, and you have a unique um, knowledge set. Yeah. So I, I, have, I have a list of like 20 novel concepts that I have awesome. sketched out. I actually, <laughs> I'm, pro- I'm probably not going to hit the schedule. I wrote, I actually, ske- a few months ago, I sketched out an Excel spreadsheet of like the ideal writing calendar for the next 10 years, fitting in those oh, wow. book ideas. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it was, it's kind of, it's, I'm, I like planning. Um, yeah. And a few of them are definitely maybe potentially like that legal environmental thriller. Like I have an idea for like telling a story where you've got, you know, you've got like some polluter that's doing really shady stuff. You can maybe take it kind of like a stranger things type narrative where like you've got yeah. some like polluter that's doing something really sketchy. Uh, or you could have, I feel like you could tell a cool political thriller at the climate negotiations level where you've got like, you know, major fossil fuel companies like trying to like assassinate climate negotiators yeah, or, dude. or something. That um, would be, and that would be so timely too. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, be cool. But, my next project is climate change related, except it's climate okay. fantasy. Climate change fantasy. Um, so like a water world. <laughs> no. So this, <laughs> this, this, this I, I actually think uh, I hope I'm not like reeling too much of my hand because uh, I've got the first draft done. I've it's now sitting. I'm pretty much letting it sit until I'm done with the publishing process, and then I'll return to it to okay. do the second draft. But uh, it is inspired by Hamilton and climate change. So it is a revolutionary war fantasy setting with climate change thrown into the mix. What a mashup. Yeah. <laughs> the two, the, it's two point of view characters, both inspired yeah. by Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, uh, except uh, the Alexander Hamilton analog is a young woman and Burr is a guy. Um, and it follows their story as they're in a essentially a city that's like kind of like pre-revolutionary war, war new york city uh and the this this revolution from like a larger empire that's it's kind of like a mashup of the british empire and the roman empire um mm-hmm. easiest way to say it um and but at, so at the same time that they're dealing with this like really real like political turmoil they're slowly yeah. starting to uncover this like truth regarding the way magic works in the world that and that's how i inject climate change into the mix is that uh there's something else going on i'm not going to spoil much of that because i'm really <laughs> proud of the I, i'm really hopeful that i this is i'm, I'm going to be trying really hard to actually traditionally publish this book because yeah. i think i've hit something especially with the timeliness of hamilton uh i've hit a, a story that hopefully will uh attract an agent for that story but i i and so on fun, that man. yeah oh i'm excited <laughs> that's great yeah those are the best when you when a when a idea comes to you that like lights you up so much that you're just like God I can't wait to write this freaking story it's gonna yeah. be amazing oh no absolutely um and it's it's been yeah it's it's got a lot of work to go I I like after finishing the first draft I was like all right we need to like set this aside for a second it's the first book I've written with multiple point of views um which was interesting it's like their so, narrative. Yeah, so it's third person narrative. Each chapter switches point of views between the two characters. Um yeah. and, but but I I it helped because they're never really far from one another. There's lots of chapters where both characters are in the scene. So um okay. what what's fun with that is you can then you can use you can time chapters correctly to uh hide the thoughts of uh, one of the characters if you want because <laughs> it's what from one person's perspective and then you only yeah. get to see the physical reactions of the other character um which allows for i feel like it, it allows for a uh, good injection of tension into scenes because the readers will hopefully be like 
oh, what's they what are they thinking? What are they gonna do? You know, sort of thing. Yeah, you want to get that other person's perspective to figure out what's going on in their head. Yeah, exactly. So I want to ask you this because I've always wondered. I mean, lawyers have to do so much reading. Like you guys have to study so much. Um, obviously, you love you love reading. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any writers out there that hate reading. <laughs> if there are, it's it's kind of a strange thing. Yeah. Um, one, are you are you able to speed read? Can you like read a like a page? Like, can you like photograph a page in your mind? And two, <laughs> what are your what are your, were your like inspirations growing up that you read that you were like I got I want to write something like what 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 in yeah. did you write? I cannot speed read. That would be amazing. Okay. I cannot photograph a page and look at it. I definitely can read pretty quickly, though. That's definitely something that has come in handy uh, growing up is to be able to read quickly. Though I've noticed yeah. that as I've gotten older, I definitely have made a point of reading more slowly because – I feel like when I would read quickly, there would definitely be parts of stories that I would totally gloss over and miss the significance of a scene. So yeah. I can read fast. I'm trying to read more slowly, but also that makes me sad because then I can't get through as many books. <laughs> um, no, dude, it's like there's not enough time in the world. To especially because I, so, I so through Two Doctors Media Collaborative, I am reading books too. I'm reviewing books and awesome. we, we're posting reviews uh, and – like, I, something that actually has saddened me is because growing up, to get onto the, your question, like, my favorite books are from authors that write really long books. So, like, I, I, there's the classics. So, like, you know, I grew up reading Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and Narnia and, like, those stories, uh, which Narnia is short books. Those are easy to read. But, like, I mean, the last Harry Potter books, what, like, 800 pages? Uh, yeah. Uh, Lord true. of the Rings altogether is, like, 1,000 um, and more recently, my favorite novels have been, I just, uh, when I was an undergrad and a little bit into law school, I read all of wheel of time, which was an insane mm. book series to read. Yeah. Um, there was this, so, uh, uh, one of my favorite authors is David Weber. Are you familiar with him? Mm. He writes military science fiction. Uh, okay. and he has a book series called the safe hold series that has like every book is like 700 to a thousand pages long. And uh, it's one of the most ambitious book series I've ever read. And he goes into like painstaking detail about like the technology that goes into play. Uh, And the, I I really encourage people to look that book series up because the premise is fantastic. It's this idea that an alien race entirely wipes out uh, humanity. The last of humanity flees on uh, some colony ships, like two million people flee on some colony ships to the far side of the galaxy, plant themselves on a planet, and then have to try and survive. But the leaders freak out and decide that the best way to save humanity is to wipe everybody's minds and instill a indoctrinate a religion that preaches anti-technology. And so they essentially freeze humanity in like a, a Renaissance era technology level with this. Like, <laughs> With this like Catholic Church style religion just essentially ruling the world, and so that so that's like the first three chapters of the book, the first book, and then the next chapter is uh, a young woman in an android's body wakes up in a cave, and an artificial intelligence is just like, hey, so uh, you've been dead for a thousand years, but we uploaded your mind into a robot, uh, and you now have to solve this problem because. Uh, you're our last hope because the idea is that some of the leaders disagreed and wow. so they set up a contingency plan to like solve it. Uh, yeah. And then all of those leaders got killed by the leaders setting up this church. And then yeah. this was their contingency plan was she awoke like 800 years after this, you know, church was set up. And so they set her to wake up far enough in the distance that like no one would there was no conceivable way that like the old uh, leaders were alive or like there yeah. any, so like she wakes it's up like and an a- it, like an AI like, Jesus. Coming yeah. 
Oh, and it, it's it's a fantastic. It's just such a that fantastic. That sounds movie. incredible. Say what was the name of it? That so sounds amazing. <laughs> the first the first book is called Off Armageddon Reef, and it's the Safehold series by David Weber. Okay. Yeah, it's it's such Safe a good. It, yeah, it's. Uh, that sounds I will, amazing. I will warn people though that the books are very long, and you have to be ready for very painstaking detail. I like it, but it's not for everybody. <laughs> Blows my mind when there's there's writers out there that can they can write at that level of detail and and just have that amount of story to tell. Yeah, <laughs> like, I know because well, it's not just one book, right? It's like yeah. a series of yeah. thousands of pages. It's like, are you doing anything else besides writing? <laughs> so I think the tenth mind boggling. Yeah, I know. I think I think the tenth book just came out, or it's about yeah. to release. And he's still got like three or four more to go. And like the story spans into a worldwide war. And so like he's he he literally maps like mapped out and like some of these maps are revealed in the book. But like he goes through like every front of the war, both like on land and naval. And so it's funny because it's like takes place like 1200 years in the future. But the story like the conflict plays out on like. 17th century galleons <laughs> and like they're fighting like navy naval battles in the in the ocean and stuff that's wonderful i love yeah. writers because yeah just like those creative unbelievable minds that are just creating these entire universes to play around in yeah that's the most fun yeah absolutely um yeah i i, I like this, this first of their kind takes place on earth uh, but I'm excited for not only where I'm going to potentially take this story in the future, um, yeah. and that def the, the the groundwork for that is definitely laid by the end of the second book. Uh, no, not enough people go into the planet. I feel like everyone goes to outer space. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> have you thought about this? Mm -hmm. Taking your story into the crust of the. Pl I mean, you're you're environmentalist. You know, it, you're into just take it into the planet. That's 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 a that's a creative setting for a story, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like you get in there and you yeah. fix things, man. <laughs> like, you yeah, gotta, you gotta start from the start yeah. from the middle. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I definitely think there's there's a trend in science fiction to take stories, you know, away from Earth. Yeah, and I did it with mine. <laughs> and I, I I I will say I have that tendency too. But I'm definitely in thinking about my f future writings. I definitely want to ensure that a lot of my writings are grounded in what's happening on earth and especially with uh with climate change like i i definitely want to dive deeply into climate fiction whether it's climate fantasy or what's going on here um yeah. one of my um and this actually this is a book that i'll probably write within the next few years uh is a story where uh like super dystopian post-apocalyptic where um so national geographic has these fantastic maps on their website mm -hmm. that predicts what sea level rise would look like if all of the ice caps and glaciers melted and it's like 277 feet worth of melt which actually if you think about it like at the same time that sounds like a lot but then you're like yeah. oh that doesn't sound like too much, but then you realize how much of the coastline is actually like how far inland 277 feet goes. And it's a lot. Yeah. And they have these great maps that show what that looks like. And so I have this idea for a story that, and by the way, that would take like 3000 years to occur. Like it would take a really long time for us to get to 277 feet. Um, so I have this idea for a story that would take <laughs> place That's good. if that happened. Yeah. And so it essentially would just be a society that just totally failed ch to fix climate change and just like reverts back to like Stone Age level tribalism. Um, but they would nice. be living amongst the ruins of like real cities. So like the image I have in my mind is of someone like floating on the water in a canoe with the very top of the Washington Monument just like peeking out of the waves. That's cool. Yeah, that's like the entire concept of the book in my mind right now. But <laughs> wow, that's it. No, it's a, it's a great, it's a, it's an awesome idea. I know that um, in like the book Fifth Wave, the I don't know if you've read that, but I've not. The, the sea levels all came in, so like the only livable 
place in America was like the Midwest yeah. area. So it's like living within that confined space. Yeah. It's it's ba- I mean we could basically just run out to the ice caps with hair dryers and make it go a little bit faster. Melt <laughs> <laughs> all those giant ice cubes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we'd want it. I think only Russia wants that to happen. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully hopefully it does not happen. Hopefully yeah. we can stem the flood. Yeah. Um CD Tabner, I, I really appreciate you coming on the Uweb show, man. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm I'm super excited to read this uh, first of their kind. I would love to do a review for you as well. And and I want to, I mean, I know it comes out April 30th. Um, oh, I'm, I'll I'm definitely, so, I'll send you an advanced copy. Stuff. I'll send you an advanced copy. Please. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like this kind of stuff, this is the kind of stuff that excites me the most because I think I'm on the other side of the fence. I think we're going to be able to download our consciousness into something. Nice. And become like immortal robots. You should skip chapter two of the book then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're like, if anybody believes it, you're an idiot. <laughs> no, no, I don't say that. It's just a, it's a joke. You'll, you'll appreciate chapter two, I think. You'll also okay. appreciate, not for spoilers, but if you think that, you will also appreciate the very final chapter of the second book. So now you have to read both. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> no, that's great because it, it is. It's exciting stuff because we're on the cusp of it. And it's it's almost like reading any kind of like realistic apocalyptic stuff that's potentially can happen. Yeah. It's it's like it's almost like a survival guide. <laughs> like I'm reading for my survival when I'm what 30 years in the future, I'll be 60, 63 years old. Yeah. Be beating off these synthetic robots with sticks <laughs> in my front yard. Yeah, you know? you, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna read my book and be like, oh man, I'm totally the antagonist in this story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me, and uh, you know, I, I look forward for I, I'm gonna check out some of the stuff you've written. I hear you've uh, written two books, so I'm excited to go take a look at what those are. Oh, yeah. uh, what? <laughs> What'd you I'm say? An author. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, I, I encourage everyone listening. Hopefully, I haven't uh, bored you too much that you uh, don't want to read my book now, but I promise it's... Uh, it, I had a lot of fun writing it, and so hopefully everyone has a lot of fun reading it. Awesome, man. It sounds fantastic. Can't wait to check it out. Available April 30th uh, for digital download. Available possibly April 22nd for paperback copy on Amazon. Um, CD Tabnor, thank you so much for coming on, man. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon, okay? Thank you, Matt. All right, brother. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what?